it's stay you know stage at times i don't think it truly is hence why you know will laura and guy are on this call today sharing their great knowledge as it were no I, I, absolutely uh, and talk of show knowledge will what what would be some of the things that, that you'd uh highlight to you know like a first time exporter you know what what, what have you learned along the way that uh, has been on their journey Know your terms would be one of the most important ones, whether it's DDP or Xworks or FOB. We work with a few corporates and they want it done a very specific way. And uh, when we went and you know, made that first transition, I think we've got, we had 16 grand of VAT that was sat kind of, we paid, they paid. And it was, you know, all up in the air trying to get that, you know, deal with that. And that probably took a year to, to, to kind of fix. So know your terms and kind of get as much training as you can. We've worked with the local Chamber of Commerce and they've provided loads of different training resources and courses and uh, all sorts that have been really helpful to kind of get our team to that kind of point where they're more like experts in shipping rather than just someone who's been kind of moving things about like you had to before. Yeah. And uh, Laura, what, what, what advice would you share? I think I'd obviously build on what Will says for sure, um, because sometimes as well, the customer, I know perhaps you've got customers that know exactly how they want it done. I've also got sort of the opposite end of the spectrum where they they have no idea about any of that. And you're trying to almost educate the customer, you know, in the best way possible um, to try and get a good understanding across to them about how, you know, we're going to do um, business going forward. Um, and especially in new relationships, that can be challenging, um, even though, you know, we're, we're quite a way into this now. And most people you would think are familiar with the paperwork and, you know, what, what needs to be done and whose responsibility is at various points. But I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding around that um, and just raising like more awareness, you know, whether that's the customer or, you know, a, a supplier around those things and just trying to help one another, really, I guess, um, that kind of coming together um yeah it, it definitely helps and and, and guy what, what what have you learned through your experiences oh we learned quite a lot i mean just one reflection though listening to the other two before i talk about that is i think when you work in digital my honestly i'm listening to those stories my kind of heart goes out so i think there's a lower barrier barrier to entry if you um a digital or professional services as a product because those you know the the, the bureaucracy associated with shipping finished goods isn't something I have to worry about. And, you know, my blood's running cold, just imagining the complexity that people have had to probably battle, um, you know, in the last three or four years, never mind COVID, but the, the Brexit and everything. Um, so so I think if, for someone like me um, or anyone who's in the digital or the unregulated professional services side, probably there's a lot lower barrier to beginning to export than perhaps people realize so so that's just a, a general thought in terms of i think your question was what have i learned um I've, i think the biggest thing is just how small the world is um now with technology so technology has made we think of ourselves as a micro multinational you know we are like i say 50 odd people but genuinely there's nothing uh, that just the technology allows us to deal with customer inquiries from literally anywhere on the planet. We have done obscure places, Chile, um, but apologies to Chile, but, but <laughs> for me, something that would have seemed 10 years ago an obscure place to do business was effortless. Mexico, um, you know, Australia, obviously that's, the, the language is a lot easier, but my word is a long <laughs> way away, but it, it's, um, th there's, uh, because of the game we're in, that um, the, there's, that you shouldn't believe if you're in professional services or in digital, that there are enormous barriers to stopping you entering. And I think, again, when my mindset changed from that, that transformed our business. Yeah. And Guy Cat has a, has a Queen's Award for international trade. So what what is it that made you, I suppose, uh, apply for that? And, and what difference does it make to the business? Yeah, no, I mean, it's one of those things. That, so because we've grown organically, we'd never really blown our own trumpet. We don't haven't particularly entered many awards and that was one of the ones that had a bit more kudos it's kind of a lot of the awards forgive my cynicism you kind of pay your entry fee and if you've got a good relationship with whoever's putting it on you're more likely to walk away with it the, the, the queen's award seems it's properly audited um, there isn't you know there's not a limit on how many if you do it if you meet the criteria the chances are and you go into it in a good in good faith the chances are, uh, you know, you'll be successful at the end of it. So I think it comes with a, a 
level of kudos and and mm. and and credit and recognition. Also, do you know what? it was awesome for our team. So could, normally in awards night you can get a table or whatever, and but but to have kind of the Lord Lieutenant come to the actual premises and for everybody to be able to share in the success, you know, because that was a great day for the team. So been really uh, really glad we went through that process. Does it win us any business? Not so sure, but it can't do any harm having what's a recognised, credible logo. Uh, you know, added to your 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 um, you know, it's a bit like those ISO badges, all those kind of stuff that just credentialise that you you're for real. Um, it, it's got some credit to it, so that that's what we've got out of it. Yeah, it shows that. How, how would you know? Would presumably, you'd encourage all businesses who fit the criteria to apply for the Queen's Award. What what difference do you think it, it makes to to businesses when they're operating overseas so look you know uh the made in britain brand made in the uk sold to the world effectively which is our campaign at dit it has a market quality to it and the queen's award is something that just bolsters that market quality and we know there's a great appetite out there for british products because of the market quality again in services also like 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 guys uh that there's a mark of quality in terms of the service delivery and the professionalism with which we do things so I think you, you, it can't be underestimated. So, no, you know, I don't think you're going to win a deal on the back bit because you had the Queen's Award, we gave you the deal, as it were. I think it just bolsters that whole uh, that whole armory that you have in terms of a market quality, A, coming from the UK, B, coming from an advanced manufacturing you know, hub like this. And actually, we are, we're, we're, we're closely becoming the, you know, the, the financial and business, professional and business services centre of, of the UK. And we've seen massive growth in that. So I think it's a, something that I would encourage people applying for, certainly. And it's a market quality that just bolsters an already strong reputation that we have globally. And that's what they're looking for, right? You know, it, it, we can think of other markets out there that people will go. But you know that the perception of those markets in terms of the quality dip that you have, and we don't have that both A, in our products line and, and B, in, our, in the professionalism of our services. And I'll, I'll throw the next one out uh, to everyone to see uh, who wants to grab it. But how are events like the Commonwealth Games coming to Birmingham, you know, this summer? Are, are they relevant to you? In, in that, you know, do you think that generates added interest in the UK? Is it something you can uh, kind of ride on the back of? I think for us, it's probably more of a kind of supply chain in the sense of we feed into construction are the pressings that we make so when um you know perhaps not commonwealth games but like things like the olympics and all the building that's going on and all the you know the olympic village and things like that being done that's great because that then that definitely helps us um you know that really does feed into um our business not perhaps direct but you know it, it's still it's a great thing for us to be proud of non nonetheless do you know what i mean it draws attention for the the world onto our, our country which is great um, and whilst that's kind of going on, there may be other things that people notice whilst the, the spotlight is on us, which is that, you know, again, it may not be a direct thing, but I think it's something that bolsters, um, you know, everything that we do do. Will and Guy, any reflections? Um, similar sort of idea, really. I mean, the main thing is it kind of gives you a bit of a talking point. It brings a little bit of interest. And when you say you're from the kind of that area and, you know, it, it opens a, a door for an easy conversation kind of thing to some degree. Uh, it creates a bit of common ground that people can talk about and, uh, you know, form an initial bond over. And it's easier to kind of do that with some things to talk about or something specific kind of, of interest. Great. And and lo looking forward, you know, hopefully uh, we are coming out of, of the pandemic and and, and things will, will settle down and, and be more certain uh, in, in the months ahead but you know where are you at in terms of your thoughts of you know growing your international markets or perhaps trying to enter new countries are, are you are you looking to grow at the moment or just looking to consolidate uh, what you have uh, laura i think for for me we have quite a lot of return business anyway um and it's just ensuring that our lead times remain unaffected um, lead times for us is one of the biggest things um, and we've invested in new machinery so we've got additional capacity we're able to do things quicker um, because obviously when you know our actual physical goods go on uh, the arctic and they're off they go it is kind of out of our hands so if we can try and do the best that we can to you know bring that production um, time down 
and bring our lead times, you know, get them quicker. Um, you know, that's that's going to help us, um, you know, going forward, albeit whatever challenges, you know, may face with transport um, and external factors that we can't control. But we try to put ourselves in the best position possible um, to obviously navigate through it. Um, I think in some ways, having had the pandemic and obviously now we're looking at um, the war, you know, that's going on. Um, People are almost used to uncertainty and used to challenges, which is actually quite a good thing, I think. Um, there's no growth in comfort. So, you know, what, what a better time in some ways. <laughs> sure. uh, Guy? Uh, in terms of growth uh, plans, uh, yeah, look, I mean, I see nothing but opportunity, particularly in North America. So, you know, I'll be spending a big chunk of my time this year over in the US. Um, but... You know, I started by saying we we think global in everything, so we try not to be too hung up on on on. Um, you know, I'll I'll accept inbound leads from anywhere, and we'll we'll follow them up. And we, you know, like even today, I've had a couple from Sweden, um, unexpected. Uh, so I'm very very upbeat about opportunity in the next two or three years. You know, we'll hope and pray that the you know situation in in eastern europe at the moment calms down and that'll take a level of the uncertainty out um but you know i'm a one of life's optimist so i'm just gonna assume that that's gonna happen hopefully sooner than later and plan for the you know the sun coming up the next day with all the opportunities that will come come with that and, and, and will do you have guys level of optimism or I'm a pretty optimistic person. I'm I'm always the one who shoots for this is this is where we're going to be. I let the accountants bring me back down to earth a little bit, perhaps, <laughs> but uh, I try and keep myself as high high in the cut sky as I can. Um, I've got kind of big plans to kind of double the business over the next five years. Um, we want to be, you know, our primary focus is the UK market and kind of taking control and really being the major player in that. But um, we're we're very much pushing what we can do in Europe as much as possible. We kind of lost a bit of ground and we're possibly getting back to where we were pre-Brexit. Um, but I think by now, if Brexit hadn't happened, we could have doubled that. So I'm pretty keen to to take that growth back and and have that as well. So uh, I'll take whatever comes my way to some degree and uh, I'll look for the opportunities that are there. Yeah. And, and, and Shezad, you talked at the start about uh, the export strategy Uh and, and are really about the the opportunities, yeah. I suppose out, outside your uh, the, the the businesses can, can look at and, and tap into. Yeah, wh where, where do you see the I suppose the hot spots uh, for for UK businesses at the moment? So I mean, I'd, I'd say it's in all sectors. I'd say look, but you know, key focus for us is agri food and drink, which is particularly strong in certainly in the East Midlands. You know, financial and professional services like uh, guys and business services. You know, Birmingham is quickly becoming, as I said previously, home to a booming uh, FMPS sector. Creative industries, education, tech and digital, consumer and luxury goods, clean growth, which goes without saying, you know, because of COP26 and, and the focus on sustainability. So I, I think it's all to play for, but I think the strengths that we have in the middle is that can definitely be exported. Um, again, look, you know, th there's great opportunity and, and you know, the government's never had more of a focus on place-based approach now with levelling up, as it were, and putting that extra support in. So we're working across with our counterparts, you know, Will mentioned Chambers, FSB, CBI. So the focus, we know the strength of our recovery and our resilience lands on us, export, you know, exploiting all those markets and all those opportunities. And make sure, and government is, is, you know, backing that wholeheartedly as part of the, not just levelling up agenda, but as part of the 10-point plan as well. So look, there's never been a better time to get the support that you need and from the good folk on this call as well. So, you know, I if I you yeah, know, forget government, right? It, it's it's yourselves that are doing the job and seeing and got this, you know, potentially the scars as well. And I think with that, when you go and Laurie made a fantastic point, I think going through all of these things, you that uncertainty actually helps you build resilience. And actually, you're a lot more braver to deal with things. That's not to say, look, you know, these issues are going to come up that we need to think about. But again, with free trade agreements, we're negotiating these free trade agreements based on the feedback 
for our businesses like the panel today as well, because we know we need, need to negotiate across those issues that you're all facing. Sometimes it's regulatory, sometimes it's just, you know, obviously shipping, things like that. Tariffs really, you know, it's tariff free. That's the best potential as it were. And, and that's what we're trying to do. And that's not to say that we'll get all clauses through all the time, but it's really listening to businesses at this stage in terms of what they're experiencing with markets. Um, and coming back to your other point, look, we've got the Commonwealth Games. We know, you know, I, I kind of make it akin to the, the Roaring Twenties, which is, look, everyone's looking for to go back, right? With, I'm, look, I'm massively enthused by coming on the panel today. You know, we're, we're, you know there's, there's an appetite for it. And whilst Commonwealth Games, right, I don't, I think in any other given year, it may not have had the attention, but there's going to be a bounce back ability and the, the, the eyes of the world will be on here like never before because people want to engage. And that can only spill over to, to all sectors and to the region, as it were. So, um, yeah, so I'm massively enthused by, by, by just the, the generosity of the good folk on the panel here today. And look, the government's backing it, and that's part of the leveling up agenda. So there's never been a focus on the Midlands like there has now with everything. It seems like the perfect time. But that's, you know, and, and I think with the uncertainty, and there will, there will, you know, we've come to expect it now, going back to Guy's term around the new normal. Uh, but we've got a better resilience to deal with it, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Joe, it's interesting. I was at an event in, in Manchester uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, and, and, and they were talking about Birmingham in the Midlands in... Uh, much more positive tones than Northerners usually do, you know, and, and that, you know, there is that recognition of, you know, much of the progress that has been made and the momentum that, that the region has uh, at the moment. And that can only be a good thing. I mean, you, you mentioned, Shazad, about, you know, those uh, support organisations. I've been interested, Laura Will Guy, you know, who do you look to and rely on for for help, whether it's at the UK end or or overseas uh, to you know help, help you overcome those bumps in the road? Yeah, I think for me it's um, leaning upon the relationship to have already with some um, people that work in transport and in that industry. Um, I've got, yeah, good relationships with them where I know I can reach out and ask things, even though I'm not necessarily going to be placing an order or something with them. Um, we've got a built such a good relationship that I can just kind of go to them as a bit of a knowledge base. Um, Chamber of Commerce, like, like Will said, that that is great. Um, there is so much, you know, materials and uh, information out there that's really accessible. Um, you know, even if that's sort of picking up the phone and being able to speak to someone as well. I think I had um, a customer from Mongolia. So we, Guy, you were talking about random sort of places that, you know, unexpected Mongolia. Okay, right. Uh, how do, how am I doing this? Um, yeah. So it's just trying to be as resourceful as possible, um, you know, and that, and that kind of unity, like you say, because of the uncertainty, um, I think people are a bit more, they're, they're more helpful. I think that, you know, we're all in this together sort of thing. Um, and we all want to, um, do well so yeah that that sort of feel um to things is yeah it helps for sure and i, I suppose that that unity comes from you know uh, mentioned earlier about having the, the sort of battle scars that, that actually those companies that are brave enough to have taken a step to export you know un understand what what other companies are going through and, and the challenges they're facing and, and and want to help where they can for sure. And I think even like customers, um, they've, you know, when we got towards the end of like the first year after Brexit, you know, they were almost like, you know, we're really thankful for your patience and your, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, hold on, you're our customer. Like, this is lovely that you're saying that, you know, um, and there, there is that sense of togetherness rather than you need to get this right. You're our supplier sort of thing. Um, yeah, it, it was nice because, yeah, I think the chaos is ine inevitable, as uh, Steve Bartlett says, and, you know, we, we go forward and, you know, we try and do the best that we can to navigate through that. Um, and, and Will, uh, where, where do you look for support? Um, well, beyond the kind of options that Laura's already given, because a lot of what we do is like fairly similar markets, like construction, physical product exports. Um, like I say, there's a lot of support and understanding and patience with customers, with suppliers, with everyone. They know that things are happening and that causes problems. Uh, beyond that, though, we've uh, there's a local peer network group that the um, it's been run uh, probably by the Chamber of Commerce again. I'm not sure, uh, but uh, we've been I've been taking part in that with kind of 10, 12 other manufacturing companies that are local to us. And of course, then it's drawing on all their experience of doing very similar things. And some of them are exporting to America, some to Europe, some to 
you know, somewhere it's plotting big things or little things, you know, there's, there's a wide range and it's it's all those other people's hands-on experience with those those import and export kind of issues and, you know, pros and cons um, that allow us to kind of make kind of more guided decisions. Yeah. And, and, and Guy, is there anybody that you particularly lean on or uh, call on? No, I mean, my, I think my experience is quite similar. So for me, you know, it's quite lonely, isn't it, running your own business? So peer networks are brilliant. So the one I happen to have uh, done the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, which gave me a cohort of people, you know, who sit in similar shoes and you can, uh, they understand what you're going through in a way that perhaps others wouldn't. So, so that's been hugely personally valuable for me. I think when we began the export kind of journey, you know, the Department for International Trade was really helpful. The, the first time we wanted to, you know, take a risk of doing a trade show overseas, we were able to get a little chunk of money and it wasn't a lot of money, but it was the difference between choosing and doing it and not doing it. And, you know, it was match funded. And I like that because I'm a taxpayer as well. And I like the idea that whoever's going over has skin in the game um, and it isn't just a jolly. But that that kind of that kind of help was, you know, it was what helped us do the first step. So I would say to people who are thinking of starting the journey, have a chat with your trade advisor and see if that kind of help's still available. Because it can just be the little the little push that you need to, to get that momentum that gets you going. Yeah, it probably shows that, that that's an important role that, that the department has, hasn't it? Just to kind of nudge people o- over the line and, and to give them, you know, <laughs> enough support for them to be able to go off on their own. Yeah, no, certainly. Look, it doesn't matter where you are on your exporting journey, if you're new, if you're experienced. I think we've got an offering for yourselves to try and support you through that. Look, if you're looking for a quick answer, uh, we've got digital offerings that's accessible and you can digest it as you feel uh, fit. Uh, We've got the export support service. So if you've got queries about trading in the EU and obviously with Ukraine and Russia at the moment, we've got that, which is a phone line. Then obviously, if you're looking for longer term support, more enhanced support, we've got the international trade advisors. Uh, and in some circumstances, you know, we've worked with businesses for over 10 years to help them grow into new markets. So they've, you know, they've grown, they've gone away and done things and then they've come back to us and, you know, we, we'll help them out later on in their journey as well. So I think that wherever you are on your exporting journey, I think what I would say is, look, be, you know, like Laura was saying as well, look, take some risks, right? But prepare as well. Take your time with our help, look into the culture, the language, entry requirements, challenges with the market as well. Uh, don't you don't do it alone and you don't need to right all the good you know you talk about chambers you talk about ourselves institute of exports there's lots of institutions that can support you uh so that you, that you don't fall over i think in, in that sort of sense and be brave look there's markets outside of eu you know uh, again going to some of those obscure markets there could be real niche opportunity uh, there as well um and again like it doesn't matter where you are uh, and speak to other businesses you know definitely come into sessions like this pick up the phone join all, on linkedin i'm sure like like you said there's a lot of goodwill out there where folks will actually just help and you know export champions we've got export champions like going back to guy as well um in terms of just that peer-to-peer support so i think i think it's integral look you know th- there's a real appetite to help as well and then j- just uh you know Look, looking forward, uh, and you know, as I said before, ho- hopefully we are uh, coming out of the last couple of years. W- what are you excited about uh, that lies ahead? You seem like an optimistic bunch, so hopefully there is plenty of excitement. Laura? Oh, you caught me there. <laughs> Off guard almost. I think you almost, the uncertainty with things is part of that excitement because you do never know what you know what inquiries you might get and what potential markets you know you might get into um for us we're really growing at the minute our uh, relationship with some of our customers in czech republic um and i don't know if you never know if it's off the back of what's happening at the minute or just because you know they like what's happening but things like that where i'm able to grow um perhaps the business and that that re that re uh, reoccurring business that comes back you know that's really important to us um we, you know, we have a lot of customers like that, but obviously we we want to nurture those and, and, and maintain the relationships we have there. But when we do get, you know, an opportunity like that come forward and we're able to look to nurture that and, and grow um, our market there, that, yeah, it is quite exciting. But I think sometimes you just don't necessarily know where that opportunity might come. And, and that is part of that um, excitement. And when it does grow, it gives you that confidence 
you know, even more to push forward into markets that are perhaps new or, you know, you're not sure of. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily an area that you know inside and out. Um, so, yeah, it, it's, it, is, it is optimistic, the, the uncertainty. Great. Uh, Will, where does your excitement lie? Ooh, we've, got, we've got a lot of stuff coming up. I mean, with all the kind of fuels, price hikes and instability in bits, it's created a lot of interest around sustainability and energy saving, something we've obviously been working hard on for the last kind of 20 years. Um, it really highlights the need for those kind of, uh, those kind of materials and goods. Um, so it really drives home what we're looking to do when there's a lot of additional government support coming out. Uh, there was the Green Home Grant that came out kind of last year or so that didn't quite go to plan, but there's lots of good new programs coming up and all of those are more opportunities to highlight, you know, the needs for for higher efficiency housing. Uh, so, I mean, that's a real big opportunity for us and I'm really excited to see how far that can go. And I enjoy change. I like changing things. I like seeing what happens, whether good or bad to some degree. Uh, so, you know, there's there's lots of new exciting things happening and have been happening for the last few years. So, you know, to some degree, I'd like to like to kind of continue seeing what's thrown at me. It's a, it's a good mindset to have. Uh, Guy? Oh, just, in, you know, as I said before, I'm one of life's great optimists. Um, very excited about, you know, as we drive forward, the business we're in is all about, you know, helping people move to digitized ways of working. I think there's just lots of that coming um, forward. We're very excited we signed a partnership agreement yesterday with a company in in belgium which gives us a new product line really excited about the possibilities that are open in north america so i'm just really looking forward to growing the business over the next few years fantastic and the final word uh, to you shazad yeah no i mean obviously i'll be uh, excited by all the free trade agreements that we're hoping to sign and get ratified and over the line i think for me look you know i'll give an example of a unicorn like gymshock right that's really disrupted the field and, and, and created such such a great enthusiasm, not just in their product line, but the region. I'd, I'd say, look, it's me looking back in five years, saying that I was on a panel with Laura, Will and Guy and saying, oh, gosh, look, 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 look where they've got doing the crazy things that they've done. So for me, it is literally that. And you will see this. You will see more gym jobs out there uh, and businesses from the Midlands actually doing this. So it, it's not the end by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, so so no, no pressure, you three, but that that's the target that's been set set for you. Just just you know, become a billion dollar business in in ten years time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we are. You know, fingers crossed. Uh, well, that, that's all we've got time for. But thank you very much, uh, Laura, Will, Guy, and Shazad for for your contributions. I hope uh, our, our audience has, has enjoyed that and, and certainly learned a lot. I, I've no doubt they will have done. So thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thank you all. Thanks. Okay, and after talking about going global, we're going to uh, flip the perspective around and, and look at inward investments and, and those uh, companies and, and sectors that are looking at, at the Midlands to place their factories and, and expansion uh, activities. You know, inward investment is obviously an important part of the Midlands economy and attracting long-term high-value jobs to the region uh, is, is a key aim uh, of, of many of the support organisations that work throughout the region. Uh, I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined uh, by two of those uh, organisations, uh, Kevin Harris, who's the chair of Leicester and Leicestershire LEP, uh, and Anita Bala, who's the chair of Greater Birmingham and Solihull LEP. Uh, thank you both for joining us uh, at Invest Midlands. I suppose if, if we start briefly by, by looking looking back before we uh, spend most of our time looking forward, obviously the last couple of years have been challenging. Uh, Kevin, if I start with you, how how has it affected, I suppose, the, the pipeline of investment activity or how, how, how we approach those conversations? Uh, well, good afternoon, Alex. Thanks for inviting me onto the panel. Uh, really excited about uh, being on today. Um, yeah, it's been a challenge, obviously. I mean, I've just listened to the conversations on your previous calls, and um, there's been a lot of challenges out there. But I think we've we've got very robust um, structures in you know across the Midlands, and certainly if I look at the East Midlands and Leicester and Leicestershire, um, we, we've we've got used to over the years dealing with 
significant blows. And yeah. and obviously what happened in, in Leicester with being the, the sort of in, in lockdown for even longer than most places across the UK, I think we've got a re very resilient workforce and a very resilient uh, set of businesses. Obviously, it's a very much an SME focused uh, economy. Yeah. The East Midlands is predominantly. Um, so a lot of those businesses have, have got used to having to adapt to change. And obviously, they've they've changed significantly. But actually, a lot of those businesses that have now come through have come through a lot stronger in many ways um, and even more resilient. And I think that's something that we're seeing. In, you know, my day job is obviously a partner in, a, in an accountancy firm and I'm working with businesses every day of all sizes. And I think there's a big positivity now about the future. And we've seen a lot of big projects around this, this part of the world. Things like, um, you know, Space Park, which has just reopened, which opened last week, where we, we set out four or five years ago to make some real plans for those big structural changes and, and they've happened. And then we've got the exciting developments of things like, you know, the free port and whatever to look forward to. So it, it really feels as if we've now started to come out of it, but come out of it in a very positive vein. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, sorry, I'm just picking up. I mean, uh, d during COVID, uh, the, I'm chair of B Music and uh, we had a capital project that we started just weeks before um, lockdown. And you can imagine I had a few sleepless nights, as did my colleagues. But actually, construction continued and um, we had in the first few weeks it was really you know how do we how do we manage the workforce while they're keeping a distance and carrying bricks up and down and and all of those practical things but if you look at some of the investment that we put around paradise etc construction kept on going the, the the cranes were still there they had to find a different way of working and i think it was very heartening to see how they did that our person my my project actually delivered on uh, on time and on budget of course there were issues about getting things over transported over uh, we had um, you know panels stuck in europe um, but it was a really creative time people were able to look at finding ways of getting those panels across or can we source something else so i think yeah it was hard it's been hard but actually um, i think the resilience of our, our workforces um, and companies showed through that Joe, it's, it's interesting. You know, I like like many people, you know, effectively permanently worked from home for a long while. So, so a project like yours, Anita, just one day went, oh, it's done. Doesn't it look fantastic without without any of the uh, uh, steps in between? It was a bit like that because public didn't see it because you know we really were in lockdown and and our plan, original plan was to keep the business going, keep Symphony Hall going, keep town, keep our business going, but put you know put block ourselves up from from the building work. But then suddenly people come into the city centre and they see, oh, the whole of uh, that the uh, that Chemley Square has been transformed, our buildings been transformed, new spaces have been created. It was almost like. Um, going away and coming back to a new city it felt like that and I think lots of people commented wow is this what I've uh, I've come back to and, and so that created a bit of excitement too yeah and and in, in terms of you know inward investment in those conversations with uh, uh, international partners what what is it that they're looking for at the moment have has it changed or or are they looking for the same you know I suppose fundamentals? I think things. Sorry. Sorry, Nisa, you go. I think things have changed because you know we, we've changed as a world, haven't we? Uh, we? We've changed as our businesses, but I, I, I think we UK still has um, uh, the potential to bring in you know foreign investment and all kinds of in, in investment. But I think people are now maybe looking for um, um, different ways of working with us thinking you know if there is another panic how do we cope with it they're, they're looking for coping mechanisms um i mean i, I know lots of leps did this but we put in a, a project called step forward to support our small businesses during the, the covid crisis and for some it was providing a, a glue just to uh, to sort of keep them going ticking by but for others it was fundamental in keeping them for their survival so if we can show that resilience to external you know, around the Midlands and say, look, look at, look at us. We, we, we're, we're up for it. We're up for foreign investment. Um, MIPIN, we've heard about MIPIN. You know, there was a 15 million potential of 15 billion projects to come out of that. I think we just have to find a, a more flexible, prove to, to investors that we, we can be flexible and that we have something in our back pocket, which will, if things do go pear if we have another uh, 
pandemic or, or whatever, that we have learned lessons from that. And I, I don't know, Kevin, whether that's been your experience. Yeah, I think I think what there's been also been an emphasis on is, I mean, it, and and Anita will know this as well. You know, I was a chair a few years back when we when we were asked to look at local industrial strategies by government, and I think what that did was focus our minds on, you know, where our strengths lay and what what natural resources and other resources we had available. And, and, and I think it also emphasised the importance of place. I think place is absolutely critical now, as we all know. And, and looking at what, what differentiates you from the rest of the UK or the rest of the world in many ways. And, and I think we looked at the assets we've got, certainly in the Midlands. You know, one of our great assets is, you know, we're smack bang in the middle of the country. The, the whole connectability bit is, is superb. And, and to be in the central hub of, of that network. And I think in the past, we sort of maybe, maybe didn't appreciate that as as important as it really is but it is massively important now and i think given that we've got people now want to you know work in different ways then actually the place that people are located both from a business point of view but also living and where they want to live and quality of life is really important so i think you know we've got a a fantastic place proposition for the midlands as a whole east and west we've got a fantastic brand you know we've got the history of being you know manufacturing industrial revolution everything that came out of that as the as the heart blood of uh, you know real real sort of uh, driving things forward and we've got an economy now that is you know significant sized economy you know the, the midlands economy is the same size as denmark i mean you have to look at that and just think of that for a minute that is phenomenal and and i think we we've got to focus on that that great brand we've also got an incredibly skilled workforce and i know there's a lot of talk about skills and that we we need to constantly improve the level of skills but you see now the kind of sectors that we're investing in across the Midlands and creating those clusters and hubs are ones which are very tech based, you know, high skilled uh, and taking us a bit away from maybe where, where we used to be in the past of, of being a bit of a low skill, you know, low, low value in it, value chain um, entrant. But now I think now we are right in the middle of that and we've got to play to those strengths and, and really reinforce that as Midlands brand, you know, I sit on the Midlands um engine board and we really have to reinforce those strengths to the rest of the world and take them forward as a as a collective proposition yesterday i was at the new hsbc uh, headquarters in the middle of birmingham it's not so new now but but it's fantastic the views are great and you know they've got hundreds and hundreds of staff in there and i was talking to them about the challenges of bringing people back in um and yes they're slowly bringing th those people back in but we hear about stories about people relocating from london uh, for them for goldman sachs and for for all the other big companies coming in into the midlands um and i, I was talking to the person who was taking us up and down in the lifts and she said she relocated from London and I, and I was asking, I was curious, you know, were there any issues? She said, no, you know what makes it exciting? There's a, there's a, the housing was easy, there's the schooling if you wanted. So there's things we do, you know, there's softer things we can't ignore when we're trying to think about inward investment. Uh, transport is building up, the trams are coming in and all of those, that, that's a package because remember in, in investment means bringing people often with, from with companies, but people are human beings, you know, they do need, they do have families, they do need housing, they do need to feel comfortable. And there's the whole diversity of people, you know, we can't, we don't just have one uh, solution for, for all. And I think we, in the Midlands, we are great at, at, at diversity and embracing diversity because we are such a diverse re region. We were just talking about, you know, Kevin's in, in, in Leicester, I'm in Birmingham, and you know, all, all of the communities that, that, that go on there is really important. So I think one of the other lessons, and you've touched upon this, is that investors need to think about placemaking. And, and I'm, I'm passionate about culture and the creative economy because, you know, people want to see good art, they want to see good culture, they want to see how they can have a nice out, what are the pubs, clubs, bars, restaurants like. And, and I think while our bars, restaurants, clubs, hotels were closed. Um, we felt it, the economy felt it. Um, now they've opened up, that just showcases the importance of, of that, that partnership between what we call hard business and, and, and the, the softer business. And never more is this going to be important um, as now when we get the Commonwealth Games, people from all over the world coming, not just to Birmingham, they're going to go, be going to Stratford-upon-Avon, they're going to be going to Leicester for a dosa or whatever. Um, and it, we ought to be passing people around the region just to say, you may be investing in this city or this town, but actually 
look at the bigger picture. And yeah, I think yeah, that's the middle yeah absolutely, absolutely right, Anita. And I think one of the things that, you know, I have this discussion not only east to west, but also within the East Midlands is, you know, one of the things we've always been guilty of, I guess, in the East is is the high degree of competition that's existed between the sort of three counties and three major cities that, that exist in the East Midlands. And you've almost had an internal sort of dogfight for many years about which which city or county will will get something and and actually as a result of that we've often lost investment coming into these midlands because it hasn't been a a collective joined up approach to that it's it's much more collaborative and joined up now and if i look at it you know my relationship with the other lep chairs in the east midlands greater lincolnshire or d2n2 derby and knots is is much much stronger and there's an acceptance now i think that it may be that you know nottingham is the best place for this business to go to and leicester should support that because the involvement importance is getting it into the East Midlands or the Midlands generally we shouldn't really be looking to try and compete against each other let's look at what we are particularly good at in Leicester Nottingham Derby or the West Midlands as well and let's get behind each other and support that I mean that's been evident with the, with the Commonwealth Games because you know everybody's got behind that and that's whether that's the East Midlands other parts of West it's not just Birmingham um, it's everybody's got behind it and everybody will benefit from that because most of our people travel around the Midlands or the East and West Midlands, they don't just live and work in one place. They they want the benefits of the whole region. So I think we just got to be very, very open of recognising our strength sometimes is in our size and scale as the Midlands. And, and you know, I know Sir John Peace and the, the Midlands, you know, board always feel that we, you know, we need to do the collective. We need to pull it all together. When you pull it together, it's a very, very attractive proposition. Mm. Um, and we, we've got, if you think about technology and digital, and uh, that where, where there's a lot of focus, and and and, and inward investment is coming in, into those areas. But then you look at the strength of our universities across the region. You know, the, the, there's a variety of universities, whether it's it's Leicester, or Derby, um, Nottingham, um, Birmingham, Warwick. That they, they, they're all doing different things around innovation, um, whether it's around electric cars, transport, uh, creative creativity. Uh, and I think that's exciting because there isn't uh, there aren't many regions that are so well served by universities. But actually when we now think about the leveling up agenda and the skills agenda, I think it's very important that we bring in FE here because it's not just the universities that, that are going to help deliver here on the skills, matching skills and thinking about how apprenticeships go. And when we do boot camps, where do we take those young people from one boot camp into FE or, or higher education or into apprenticeships or or, or uh, directly into, into into work. Um and I think that's still a challenge challenge for us because I mean certainly looking at the figures of, of Birmingham um unemployment among, among amongst young people, we need to shift that dial. Um and I, there's an opportunity here for us to work collectively, but also um push back on government actually around the leveling of white paper um you know how do we get into those some of our neighborhoods that are so poorly served by uh, by, by jobs and and by transport etc et uh, and education uh, and health so you know there's a package here because if your workforce is healthy and it's, it's it, the family is educated and it's got potential for accessing arts culture and you know that is what's going to make our future workforce really healthy, vibrant, and, and and joined up. Because otherwise, if we don't do that, we're going to have the haves and the haves not. We're going to have richer communities growing. We're going to have inward investment coming in, professionals coming in. We're going to be moving into the sort of nice, leafy areas of, of our cities and towns. And we will have a, a real divide. And I think we've got to, as, as businesses and business leaders, we've got to avoid that. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point because I think the Midlands performs really strongly in you know, attracting students to the universities and then retaining that talent within the region. But but it it needs to make sure that its native talent uh, can also access those opportunities and high value jobs that, that are that are here. Yeah, and, and that's that's an important point, Alex, because you know if I look at the East in particular, the East Midlands has has had a lot of issues in Leicester in particular in retaining graduates once people graduate from university. Um, and once you see that sort of drain of talent, you know, often when people leave like that, they, they don't come back. Sometimes they do. And when they come back, it's fantastic because they realize that, you know, if they'd stay, they could have had a, a great life. But you've got to make, we've got to be really, really good at, at retaining people in and re retaining that talent in the locale. And that's where we've got to get much better joined up and, and much 
better working as, across all boundaries on this between the education and the business sector. You know, we, education needs to understand what the needs of business are. Business needs to be very clear in what it needs, the skills it needs for people coming out of education, whether it's schools, colleges or universities. And we've got to try and match the two together. It's a massively difficult challenge, but this is where we need to, to, to really join that up across you know, our society so that we, we know which sectors, if I look at in Leicester and Leicestershire, we know which sectors are going to be the prominent ones now for the next 20, 30 years. We need to make sure that we're working alongside all the establishments to generate the skills coming out of local, local colleges and schools, working with them to make sure that you know, we've got that, that supply of, of skilled labour coming forward into the workforce for many years to come. Otherwise, that will be the biggest thing that will hold us back. I wonder if there's a challenge for our local workforce with flexible remote learning, because, you know, if if, if you can sit in, in India and provide a service here um, to, you know, professional service, bank, whatever, and, and, and charge whatever you want and not never have the overheads, what does that do for our local um, people, local young people who we're trying to keep in? Um, and, and I think we need, we need to have a, an honest conversation about the dangers or potential possible dangers there and, and how do we, um, you know, mitigate for that and how do we work with a workforce that can now work from wherever um, and, and what does that do to the cities when we're trying to, cities and towns when we're trying to bring people back in so they can buy their coffee, they can buy their croissant in the morning and help that local economy. So there's still a lot to be talked about here that we haven't really squared up yet. This, this is a big area where LEPs play a major role. Um, you know, I mean, LEPs, the convening power of LEPs, I mean, governments address that and, and recognise that now in the Leveling Up White Paper. Really for the first time, let's be honest, you know, there wasn't a lot of recognition before that of the role that LEPs have played. You know, I work in, in the private sector, but working alongside and chairing the board, which is made up of private sector, public sector, and, you know, education establishments as well in all parts of society. The importance there is now that we recognise that somebody has to play that role of convening and bringing all of those key stakeholders together. And frankly, you know, when there were a lot of concerns about whether LEPs would continue and survive, I think the biggest question that was put back to, to government on this was, well, if LEPs weren't there, one, a lot of things would not have happened because nobody would have convened it. And secondly, if you take them away, what are you going to replace them with? And those questions really would need to be asked. And that's why it's good, I think, that it's been recognised now. The importance is to kick on and recognise that, you know, LEPs play a really important role in this. Business needs to understand that. A lot of businesses do, but a lot of businesses still don't. But then we need to recognise that the power is in that convening and collaboration role and bringing Absolutely. together those key stakeholders. Uh, I mean, around our tables, we have we have private public sector. So we have leaders of councils and, um, and districts and and we have um, our vice chairs of universities, our FE rec rep represented uh, private business. There isn't anywhere else that you can get that. And, and also because we work with small businesses, I mean, uh, particularly s s supporting the, the, the smaller businesses and helping growth at that end uh, of, of the market. And I think that is unique. If you didn't have LEPs, you'd have to create something like like. Yeah, and, and I think you mentioned you mentioned it at the start, Anita, that one of the things that um, that LEPs have done throughout the last two years when we've had the, uh, the, the pandemic and, and the difficulties around, even with Brexit as well thrown in, the growth hubs associated with LEPs have been a key area for many, many businesses, first port of call, and an area that that's provided that support and direction um, you know, to so many SMEs. And I dread to think, you know, if they hadn't been around, what would have happened? Because I know there's many, many businesses that have survived in Leicester and Leicestershire because of this fantastic support the growth have provided. Um, without it, they wouldn't be there, frankly. And that's regardless of the support, financial support the government's provided, people still need somewhere to be signposted and they still need people to go to to provide that support and advice and access to finance. And without the growth hubs, I simply don't think a lot of businesses would have found them. I think growth hubs are, are absolutely crucial. I mean, I think I can't remember the exact figures, but some, something like two and a half thousand businesses have been through our growth hub and, and been supported and, and handheld and, and helped, helped secure investment. And they've gone on and, and, and survived so so that that growth up is, is those growth ups are going to have to be important I think the, the, the complexity will be that all the LEPs are in slightly different positions those of us in combined um, uh, mayoral authorities uh, are in a, on a different page to those that are trying to do county deals and and so it's a 
bit of a mess, but but one hopefully that we can steer our way through. Um, yeah, and, and I think the key thing there, and, he, and you're absolutely right. You know, there's a, the, you know, leveling up white paper at the heart of that was obviously the whole devolution agenda as well, and and giving more power back to the the, the, the locale uh, areas. You know, mm -hmm. to to determine their own destiny, if you like, but. There's so much work that still needs to be done in making all of that happen. And if, you know, different in the east to the west very much, where obviously you've got the, the mayoral combined authority and Andy Street in place. But it's important that, you know, it doesn't all revolve around that. There's also other other parts of the, the West Midlands that need to make sure they get their fair share of what, what they're looking for. And in the east, we've got significant issues, obviously, around the fact that you have got the three counties and the three different mm -hmm. structures, uh, you know, single tier in some places so there's a there's a lot to sort through but actually if we can get through it and if we can get something that's sensible for each location the benefits there are enormous and that's what we've got to strive to do yeah absolutely i think having that uh, sort of clear coherent voice is really important and Anita, you mentioned about the 15 billion pound pitch book that uh the west midlands took to mip him you know how how important is it to be able to demonstrate that the scale of the ambition on an international stage. Uh, you it's, know, to, it, it's massive, Alex. I mean, I went to MIPIN. I've done MIPIN many, many years. I didn't go this year and haven't been through the pandemic, but I went to MIPIN probably every year for six or seven years. And, you know, there were so many developments that I can point them out in, in Leicester that would not have happened. And it, it's strange because some of the developments that happened in Leicester were between developers that are local and landowners that were local. But until they went to the south of France and, and sat around the table or had a glass of wine together, they they actually wouldn't didn't get that deal done. They got that deal done when they were in front of each other because it gave them the the, the platform to do it. So it's bizarre how these things work. But MIPIM and events like that are so important for showcasing, you know, the the opportunities that are there. And I know people tend to a lot of people knock that event, and people have said, well, it's just a jolly on the south of France. Yeah, there's some fun there. I've had some fun there over the years, but. There's also a lot of really important stuff that gets transacted and done there, and we mustn't lose sight of that. And and maybe we all, we, yeah. I mean, making aside, I've never been, but but I I I think we perhaps need to create a, an event of our own where people come to the region, and we 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 have. And I'm particularly thinking about foreign investment, where we bring them here because until you see some of what's happening here, um, you know. Uh, videos and, and pictures are fine, but actually, let's get get them here. And I think that's again going back to the Commonwealth Games. We should think about how businesses and how organisations like the LEPS um, use that opportunity, because for a couple of months we're going to have lots of people wanting to come here. Broadcasters from all over the world are going to be here. They're going to see the investment we've put into our infrastructures. They're going to see how our transport is working or not. They're going to see how our communities are engaging with such a big, big event. And they can then look at the potential that is there from a workforce issues, from, from creativity, from how we might be hand, handling future projects, um, how, what it, what are, the strength of our partnerships um, will have to be showcased in the coming months. Yeah, and I think what one of the great things about the Commonwealth Games, uh, you know, Touchwood, but kind of four months out, is how successful the delivery has been so far, given the challenges of the very shortened uh, delivery time, with it being, you know, originally looking at 2026 to host it and, and mm -hmm. to brought that forward, and then for COVID to have hit. But, but actually, and it, and it follows, you know, we see how the, the city's been transformed from Grand Central and Paradise and Arena Central and, and the rest that, that actually it's got, now got a great record of delivery that, that brings a lot of confidence into, uh, you know, for, for international investors to get on board with. And and we've we you know the investment and, and the rebuild has not just been around the, the stadium, but if you look, you know, in, in South Birmingham where we put together a new new station, um, university station, um, look at how uh, corridors have been created into towns and and districts and how the transport's been built there. Um, it, it's it's got to be seen as a wow. They've managed to do this with that short 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 timeline, and um, and and that that shows that we we can deliver. Uh, yeah, what, and I think, I think what's very important with the Commonwealth Games is it's great that it showcases it for a few months, but it's it's about the legacy then, isn't it? And, and you know, lots and lots of talk on the discussions I've had through Engine or, or LEPS is about how can we how can we really make this a lasting legacy? How can we really take this forward and not not just lose it 
after the few months and and, and the great sort of times of the games, how can we build that into our sort of infrastructure and take take the, the whole region forward on the back of that? And I know there's an enormous amount of work gone into that and there will be a lot of legacy effects that will come through. Uh, no, I think, sorry, one, sorry, well, one of the areas that we'd really, really need to uh, keep, keep uh, on, on people's backs actually is around skills. Because if we're bringing in all these volunteers and we've got um, short-term businesses popping up, whether it's to provide food, drink, whatever, um, wardens, you know, street volunteers, what do we do with those people afterwards? And I think the legacy is about that. And it's also about health. You know, if people have started to walk and they're going outdoor activities, how do we carry that forward? I mean, I don't think um, London 2012 Games did that really well enough. Um, and I think they will themselves, even um, uh, Lord Co will stand up and say it needed to be better on the health front. So, so the legacy has got to be tangible, but we can't wait till the end of the Games, that work has got to, and it has started now. But I think the pressure is for employers and business organisations and others to keep on finding those opportunities. Here are a whole lot of people who've been trained up. What do we do with them? It's a bit like the COVID, uh, 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 people giving us vaccines during COVID. They were trained up to do that. What do we do with them now in the health world? Surely we ought to be thinking about, we've got a workforce shortage in the health world. We've got, we need more paramedics. We need more nurses. How do we translate you know, bringing people up to a certain level, we can't just dump them because that that's that if we do that, we'll never get anyway. It's how we keep on bringing those people in. So I want to see all those people who've been giving us injections for COVID to, to be somehow transported into employment, into into a, a workforce that, that we're desperately needing to grow. And that's the health workforce. Yeah, and we had uh, Ian McLeod on uh, early from Birmingham City Council talking about specifically the legacy for the Commonwealth Games and I suppose I, I was impressed by the the breadth of activity and as, as well as the, you know the scale of our ambition that that they have but, but absolutely Anita that broader point of you know translating those skills so that they don't just sort of dissipate and and, and dissolve but actually making sure that we continue to build uh, on those in the years ahead is, is really really important I think, I think the other thing, Alex, that's really important, though, is that we don't lose sight of the need to have, you know, very bold um, infrastructure based projects that we we get around and we and we do long term planning around that. If it's one thing, you know, we could probably say as, as an economy, we've been we've been very, very poor in the past is, is, is sort of long term, certainly infrastructure planning. And some of the big things that are happening now, whether it's in the East or the West Midlands, very exciting things you know if i look at the east we've obviously got the freeport which is going to be a, a real game changer i said that on the day on the third of march when the chancellor stood up last year and announced that you know east midlands would be inland freeport we worked incredibly hard with our fellow leps to get that in place those kind of things will have enormous benefits and enormous impact for many many years to come and it's it's not only the east that will benefit it's the west midlands as well and, and other parts and and it's that joined up thinking big big projects that are really going to be game changers for us that we really need to get behind and business needs to have that voice i mean i always talk about the business voice and how the business voice gets heard yes leps is one vehicle for that chambers or other fsb iod cbi the important thing is that business is speaking with a consistent voice and it's telling government that we need long-term plans what we do in business you have to deal with the short-term immediate issues in front of you we all do but you also have to put some time aside to do some some visioning and long-term planning and and it's up to business really collectively to get together and say this is what we need government your job is to make sure we have that and have those you know infrastructure that we can then move forward with uh, Par paradise is a is a great example in birmingham because people um, from you know that there's not directly engaged with some of the community there was a great deal of criticism in the early days why we're we spending so much money but actually if you look at how uh, private uh, investment is coming and it's going to be something like 700 million coming into that and we at the lep and um, uh, the combined authority have invested in businesses have invested in it too so you know the potential for for using Quite shiny projects to, to 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 bring some of that in is 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 really important. 
but uh, Smithfield is another one, you know, and, and there we've got housing as well because there's a desire that the council makes sure that as we develop Digbeth and Smithfield on the side of um, HS2 and the new station, that we don't forget people live, are going to live around the city and it can't be all, you know, houses for people who can afford it, but actually we need social housing that complements and sits side by side uh, with private housing. And, and, and again, a good challenge, but a challenge that I think increasingly city planners and town planners are taking on board because the placemaking agenda a couple of years ago was put so high on everyone's radar and recognizing i guess that you know people how people work has changed doesn't it you know the pandemic has fundamentally changed the way people look at how they work now and you know commuting to work i mean i, I tend to be in the office probably about three days a week myself now or one of the offices um but actually, you know, that's not something we would ever have dreamed would be happening for so many people a few years ago. But there's big, big implications of that now. There's big things that we need to factor into the way we develop our you know, transport technologies, the way we look at infrastructure. People, if people can spend a lot more time in their homes, then they, they want those homes to be the kind of place that they can work in and enjoy in a different way than just enjoying it when they came home from work of a night until they went back to work the next morning and commuted. So these kind of things, we, we don't know what, future is going to hold in that regard but we have a pretty good idea but we we cannot stop planning around that and it needs to be joined up planning recognizing those changes you know the frustration i've had being a sort of lep chair for a number of years now is you know sometimes people aren't looking at it outside of their own specific area they're just very focused on their bit whether that's you know housing development housing development needs to go hand in hand with the whole infrastructure development and education and then where, where companies are going to be cited all these things and it's it's getting people to start thinking a bit wider and and we tend to be quite quite narrow in the way we look at things but i think that's changing quite a bit now uh, it's heartening to see how some business um, individuals you know running big business small business are now getting involved in in schools for example either through sitting on boards or sitting on academies and that's got to be encouraged and as we as we develop the integrated care system health systems there's got to be, and there is, the desire to have, make sure businesses sit around that table with health, with education, with, with uh, the, the city councils, so that there is definitely a joined up way of delivering. Because, you know, as I said earlier on, unless our people are healthy, they're not going to be the workforce that we need to take us forward to, to, to motor ahead. So it's very much, Kevin, you're so right, it's very much a joined up um, package here. And then in, in terms of, you know, looking forward, you know, we, we've, we've mentioned a lot, a lot of projects that are uh, long term and have, have been you know, on the table for, for, for a good few years and are being delivered now. But I suppose what, what's next? What, what's the next thing that's going to, uh, you know, the, the next new idea or will will come off the, the drawing board that, that we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see roll out over the next sort of well, 10 years well, or so? I think if I'm just coming first on that, I think I think the whole green agenda is a massive part of that, isn't it? And I think if you look at if you look at the ten point plan that the, the engine produced, and you look at what LEPs are looking at now, pretty much everything that goes across desks and tables in in any organisation now has has the green or the, the you know the carbon uh, zero carbon sort of you know agenda linked to it. And and I think we're well placed for that. I mean, I look at certainly on the east side, we've got some fantastic work going on in terms of, you know, alternative fuel technologies and, you know, autonomous vehicles, obviously at, at Hariba Meyer on the A5 and Hinkley, you know, and, and lots of hydrogen, you know, fuel work going on at various establishments around. So I think we're incredibly well placed um, to be able to deal with those big challenges that are going to come, come through. But that again, I guess has come from you know, thinking back, you know, five, 10 years ago, where did we need to put that investment into and what kind of technology were we going to need? It was that the right forward planning at that time. And we're seeing that come to fruition now. So I think those those areas in particular for me, I, I think the Midlands as a whole is very, very well placed to help with that because we've got that automotive and engineering, um, you know, technology and skills from from developing that over many years when it was when it was carbon fueled. But now, we're just developing those technologies into the next stage. And I think that is a really great opportunity for, for the Midlands to, to take forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, net zero is high on our radar. Look, look at the work we've been doing at Tinesley uh, Park, hydrogen buses, we've got them here. We've commissioned some more coming in. Um, all the work that Warwick and others are doing around electric cars, it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, going forward. 
that combined with um, health technologies, um, technologies more broadly, but particularly thinking about health technologies and the demand there, because that's another area uh, in terms of developing health technologies where foreign investors are looking at how we're doing it and is there is a role for them to play here so that that is going to be important um, and and i'm going to um, it's my hobby horse but i'm going to say this the creative economy still has the potential of bringing i think i was reading somewhere great um england was saying something like three hundred thousand jobs potentially to grow we should be growing those jobs in our region our lep has particularly invested a lot in the creative economy we've been creating cultural action zones we've invested in the content hub uh, near digbeth to think about how future um, content is created who's creating it um, the bbc are bringing um, master chef here so all that is, is that and i don't think we should dismiss that the creative economy is a, a soft economy because it isn't because national internationally people are looking at what goes on in in, in britain and um, to look at where the content is coming from where the creativity is coming from but also very importantly what's the future technology that's being developed around um uh, creative content that, that we should be leading in that because if we're not doing it who is no, yeah well, I think the importance the importance really is for us to coming back to the point i made earlier when we when we sat back and, and developed the, the local industrial strategy some time back, it was a great opportunity to take stock of where our real assets are, mm -hmm. and and what we what we're really good at. And let's you know sometimes we lose sight of what we're successful at and really good at and what we stand out for. Let's make sure we bring that to the fore and we get behind that and really push it forward as a as a saleable you know proposition to the rest of the world because uh, it's very easy to forget just what's on your doorstep and what you've got. And I think we we, we need to to make sure we don't we don't lose sight of it. Other other parts of the world and other parts of the UK are very good at doing that. We haven't been particularly great at doing it in the past, but we need to really make sure we do that now going forward. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Which, which brings us back to our joined up thinking. We we do it well, but we've got to do it better. And coming to time, so if we could just ask a final question uh, to both, and I'll start with you, Anita. What, what are you most excited about for the future? Um, I'm, I'm most excited to, to about seeing all this investment we've put in, um, uh, producing results, engaging with real people, bringing in, uh, in, in investment, bring, growing our jobs, growing our young people's skills, talent. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that we can go, do this. I think all the investment that we've put in across the region isn't going to be wasted. I think we do need to put in more investment around um, infrastructure projects, business support, um, community support. Um, but for me, I feel optimistic that I think we will. We're getting there. We're getting there. We've had, a, you know, the last two and a half years haven't been easy. So I'm excited about looking at how net zero will work out, how our hydrogen buses will be running, what electric cars, the impact they might have, how technology is going to help us to, to transform many, many areas. Um, uh, of our lives and as I've said earlier including health okay and Kevin I think I think seeing seeing the things that we've been talking about and, and working on for a number of years that are now starting to come through really come to fruition so I'm really excited about I mentioned at the start the whole space park and space technology in Leicester I think that is an enormous potential opportunity and seeing that open last two weeks ago was fantastic uh, I'm also very very excited about the impact of the Freeport and the big infrastructure developments around the airport sites and connected to that because that really does offer us a you know a game-changing opportunity to to put the region on the map in such a way that you know without an airport there or without that sort of infrastructure around it you simply wouldn't be able to to develop that now it's there we can develop around that so i think the impact of things like that plus obviously the uh the, 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 the green agenda and where how we can work and develop from that because i think we're so well placed so I'm very excited about the future in that regard, and I think we should all be very positive about that and get behind it. That uh, sounds like a, a great note to, to end on. So thank you very much, Kevin and Anita, uh, for your thank contributions. You. I found that fascinating. We've covered an awful lot in the last 40 minutes. So thank you very much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And, and that's our last session here at uh, Invest Midlands. Uh, I hope you've en enjoyed uh, the conversations, discussions, case studies, and presentations we've had uh, throughout the day. I think you know some of the things that have come through really strongly, uh, regardless of which theme uh, has been under discussion, have, have been the, those uh, you know, issues around sustainability, around collaboration and community. 
around the impact that investment is having and will continue to have across the region. And, and as we just finished on there with Anita and Kevin, that that real sense of optimism and excitement there is, I think, across the Midlands uh, for what the future holds, both in the very short term with, with you know the Commonwealth Games this summer, but also for, for the generational change that, that is now underway in many parts of the region. So thank you very much for, for joining us uh, at Invest Midlands. Uh, and we hope to uh, be able to see you all soon, almost certainly in person as spring and summer rolls out ahead of us uh, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.